Hello, everyone. This is uh, Professor Joseph Holbrook. We're picking up again today with uh, uh, Chapter Four. We are in the uh, Enlightenment, and uh, today I'm going to go over. This is Week Ten. No, I'm sorry. This is uh, the second part of Week Nine, and I'm going to go over the uh, Pietism in Germany, the Jesuits' expulsion from. The Americas and my cat came here to help me. As you can see, this is smoke. And it's going to help me do this segment. Right, smoke? Thank you. All right, smokey. Let's go. So, let me uh, jump back here. Pietism in Germany. Many in the late 17th journey... Germany were unhappy with the austerity of Lutheran orthodoxy of this age, feeling that it was out of touch with the popular mood. It was cold and theological, highly rational, and it failed to connect with the population which had been traumatized by the destruction of the Thirty Years' War. As I mentioned last time, Philip Jacob Spinner uh, published a book called Pia Desideria, Pious Wishes in 1675, he was the first one to propose what we today would call small groups or small cells, cell groups or house churches. Uh, he called them ecclesiole and ecclesia, uh, little churches within the big church. Spinner argued that the German Lutheranism's obsession with rigid theological or uh, smoke just changed just changed my slide he doesn't he's jealous and he really doesn't want me to do this all right isn't that right smoke okay so he uh had a concern for devotional life and a deepening personal relationship with jesus christ and so he proposed these personal bible studies and small groups as a means of deepening a personal living faith with god and uh, you will see that this became a key strategy of the Methodists with John Wesley in another uh, 100 years. So, uh, that was the beginning of pietism. We're not going to talk much about Moravians in this, uh, in this session. The Moravians were the direct descendants of Spinner and John Huss, and they had a huge influence in early mission work in the Caribbean, and also stood for equality of uh, Afro-Caribbeans and Africans, uh, regardless of skin color. That was the Moravians. They were German Moravians, German pietists. John Wesley was English. He was the founder and early leader of the Methodist movement within the Church of England, which subsequently gave birth to Methodism as a denomination in its own right. Uh, the story is that as a young man in Oxford University, I believe it was, he and his younger brother Charles and their friend George Whitfield would meet at 4 a.m. for prayer and Bible study, and that was their method. They were so methodical about their faith, faith that they became derisively named the Methodists, and uh, the term stuck and eventually became the Methodist movement within the Church of England. So uh, John Wesley, th this the book actually skips over an important story, I think. It talks about his conversion experience in Aldersgate, Aldersgate Street, London, in 1738, when he felt his heart to be strangely warmed. But it skips over his uh, disastrous trip to Georgia, in the uh, early around seventeen, the seventeen earlier seventeen thirties, in which he uh, went with the intention of being a missionary to indigenous people, the Native Americans, he utterly failed at that. He fell in love with a young woman. She ended up going with someone else, leaving him feeling jilted and rejected and depressed. So he returned to England, and on a uh, on the journey back to England on the ship, there was a very uh, dangerous storm. He was terrified that the ship would go down. 
and he saw a group of people singing hymns and giving glory to God and praying, and they were they looked uh, uh, angelic, they looked happy, they looked uh, hopeful, and he found out that they were Moravians. So these were the German Moravians who had uh, who were the heirs of Jacob Philip Spinner and German Pietism. He was so impressed with them that he uh, sought them out in London and went to one of their meetings, and he felt his heart to be strangely warmed, which is a fairly mild description of a con conversion experience. One of the hallmarks of evangelicals are dramatic conversion experiences or a conversion narrative. It's almost a necessity to be an evangelical Christian you must know the exact day that you uh, came to faith through a dramatic struggle with your conscience uh, and a dramatic conversion. Uh, Luther had something like this. John Wesley had something like this. Obviously, St. Paul on the road to Damascus seemed to have a conversion from his Jewish faith to a Christian faith. Uh, so that's John Wesley. You could say that the uh, Moravian Pietists and the Wesleyan Methodists were the progenitors of not only evangelicalism, uh, yeah, basically evangelicalism, with a pietistic emphasis. Wesley's emphasis uh, upon the experiential side of the Christian faith contrasted sharply with what he saw as the spiritual dullness of the contemporary English deism, also the uh, contemporary Church of England. Uh, his emphasis on this experience of, of uh, the, this, this experience of a uh, of heart relationship with God led to a religious revival in England in the 18th century. And of course, I've already mentioned his brother Charles, who was a songwriter, and uh, John also did some of his own songwriting. They uh, wrote much of the uh, hymns that, that were used in the Methodist movement. They, they uh, took a structured and disciplined approach to Christian devotion. Methodism's emphasis on the experiential side of religion raised the specter of enthusiasm, a dramatic, religiously inspired fervor, often accompanied by agitated body movements, faintings, and swoonings. A good word to use here would be ecstatic, or ecstasy, which comes from a Greek word ecstasis, which means out of body. This is a common, uh, common ca characteristic of many religions that most religions have a stream within them that emphasizes ecstatic devotional worship. The uh, Sufi order, the whirling dervishes within Islam, Hasidic Judaism, uh, Santeria certainly is ecstatic, and uh, there are some, um, some ecstatic sects within Hinduism and Buddhism. The phenomenon of enthusiasm was widely ridiculed by English religious commentators. Many revivalist preachers, including John Wesley and George Whitfield, found themselves torn between sympathy for the idea that a direct experience of God might induce such dramatic effects, but they were also concerned that the bizarre manifestations might alienate a religiously suspicious public. Despite their differences, the various branches of pietism succeeded in making Christian faith relevant to the experiential world of ordinary believers. In some ways, anticipating the success of a Pentecostalism two centuries later. We will later t return to talking about Pentecostalism, and I'm developing a class to teach about uh, Pentecostalism. Pietism succeeded in lodging Protestantism in the everyday realities of life for many people. It's of no small Important to note that the strongly anti-religious tone of the French Revolution in the late 18th century was partly due to the absence of any equivalent to pietism in the French Catholicism of that time. Unlike Great Britain, I suppose the author is saying. The American Great Awakening, the revival was not breaking out in merely Germany and England, but in the, eight, in the early 18th century. The revival was not breaking out merely in Germany and England in the early 18th century, but also in the United States. Actually, you can't say the United States in the 1730s. You'd have to say in the uh, British colonies. So I, I hate saying America because in my mind, the whole Western 
hemisphere is at the Americas or America. So I prefer, I guess I'll say the British colonies. In the British colonies, the Great Awakening ushered in a new period of religious devotion, which many scholars see as the backdrop to the American Revolution of 1776. One of the most distinctive features of North American Protestant Christianity was the phenomena of the awakening. One book I read uh, points out that there have been spiritual awakenings about eight, every 80 years, beginning around 1720. Again, in, actually, that's a little bit more. It's more closer to 120 years. 1840, uh, the 1910s, uh, it varies somewhat. But there have been the there have been a number of awakenings in uh, roughly eighty to hundred year cycles in American history. By seventeen hundred, American Protestantism appeared to be stagnant. The first generation of Puritan immigrants possessed a driving religious vision, which was not always shared by their children. Church membership began to decline as the spiritual fervor of an earlier generation of Puritans was displaced by the pragmatism of their descendants. And a series of scandals rocked the credibility of Puritan institutions. The worst was the Salem Witch Trials, around 1693, in, in, instigated by the clergy of Salem, which resulted in the execution of 19 people. Tensions began to emerge over church membership in New England. The congregations had a policy of admitting to full membership only those individuals who could provide a narrative of personal conversion. And there again you see some of the influence of pietism, which later turns into evangelicalism. As the century progressed, fewer and fewer individuals could testify to such experience. For example, my wife never had a definite moment of conversion. She felt like she had always loved God and always wanted to go to church and do the right thing. And so uh, this is a, a conundrum for some, some in the evangelical church. A compromise was finally reached in 1662. A halfway membership was accepted by some congregations. Uh, which allowed those people who were prepared to formally accept the truth of Christianity and the moral discipline of the church to have their children baptized. This was res the result of this idea of a halfway covenant was perhaps inevitable. By the beginning of the 18th century, a large portion of church members were nominal or halfway Protestants. Now we're talking about in New England. All of this changed with the first great awakening. From about 1735 to 1745, much of New England was engulfed in a religious renewal. I guess the Second Great Awakening must, must have been around 1810s, 1820s. So I guess that would be about 80 years. Contemporary records speak of a mass outdoor meetings, occasionally attracted 20,000 people, open air sermons, deserted taverns, and packed churches. One of the central figures of this revival was Jonathan Edwards, the pastor of a Massachusetts town called Northampton, which experienced a revival during the winter of 1734-5. As the revival spread across New England, it was given a new sense of direction by George Whitfield, recently arrived from England where the evangelical revival was changing the religious landscape. And here's a picture above of Jonathan Edwards, and to the right, George Whitfield. By 1760, it was clear that the awakening was bringing about significant changes in American Christianity. It was not simply that people were returning to church, or that religion was playing an increasingly significant role in public life. The revival changed the nature of American Christianity bringing about a changed understanding of the relationship between the individual congregation and the state. Whereas the French Revolution took place against a background of growing popular disenchantment and alienation from the Christian church, the American Revolution would take place against the backdrop of a growing religious enthusiasm and commitment. Where some would argue that the French Revolution saw Christianity as its enemy, 
the American Revolution was not in any way anti-religious. Now we're going to jump over to uh, South America primarily and the Society of Jesus, otherwise known as the Jesuits. Uh, it, by the way, a great film about this, besides the mission with Robert De Niro set in 1755 in Paraguay, which is a great film which illustrates the central point about their suppression and expulsion from South America. There's another film called Black Robe, set in 1634, and the Jesuit endeavors to uh, missionize indigenous peoples in uh in North America, in basically in Canada, beginning in uh, Quebec. But so there's two films that I recommend. There's another one called Silence about Je Jesuits in Japan. So the Jesuits were founded by Ignatius Loyola in 1534 and became one of the most influential and powerful religious orders of the Catholic Church. It was especially active in missionary work in Latin America and was widely regarded as one of the most significant outcomes of the Catholic Reformation. Its power and influence created hostility and opposition from the monarchs of Europe. Loyola was a former soldier and realized the importance of organization and discipline. His vision for the order envisioned a tightly centralized organization which stressed total obedience to the Pope and their religious superiors. As a result, they did not see themselves as being accountable to European nation-states, colonial powers, or monarchs, such as the King of Spain or the King of Portugal, or even the King of France. Tensions began to rise in Latin American colonies of Spain and Portugal when the Jesuits intervened to protect the rights of Native Americans. And you will see this clearly illustrated in the film The Mission. Uh, the music score, Ennio Morricone, Gabriel Zobo, I love it. Uh, but it does explore these issues of the tension between uh, Jesuits and the king, king of uh, Portugal, for example. Where Spain and Portugal proposed to treat Native Americans as little more than slave labor, the Jesuits established local Native American city-states known as Reduc Reducciones, in Spanish, and Reducioish in Portuguese. Modeled on religious ideals, these city-states provided a buffer against economic exploitation of the Indians. The rhetoric and theology were not entirely unlike those found earlier in the prelude to the English Civil War. Did I miss this? Nope, I didn't miss a slide. I must have jumped some content. So it was the American Revolution. So was the American Revolution a war of religion, like the English Civil War? The point that he's making here is that one aspect of the American Revolution was tension between Pil Puritans and Anglicans, or members of the Church of England, which was partly a class conflict, a rising middle class with the nobility. Most scholars believe it was not, and prefer to speak of it as a war of independence, a defensive revolution against tyrannical oppression. Religious concerns were certainly involved. Above all, a desire to ensure religious freedom and eliminate the privileges of the established church. Yet it would not be true to say that these concerns, concerns dominated the agenda of those driving the revolution. Just uh, think about the fact that you had uh, uh, Quakers in Pennsylvania. You had Catholics in Maryland. You had Dut uh, the Dutch Reformed Church in New York and Jews. And you had Congregationalists or Puritans in New England, Baptists in Rhode Island, and the Church of England in Virginia. And Methodists uh, starting to be scattered all over. Uh, that was a, uh, w a wild west, a religious wild west. And so it would have been impossible for them to impose a single church on the, the uh, British colonies. The patriots came from a wide variety of religious backgrounds. Some were driven by the anger of New England Congregationalists against the religious privileges of the Anglicans. George Washington was a somewhat unorthodox uh, uh, person 
possibly being best described as a deist. Following the revolution, the Church of England was reconstituted in 1799 in Philadelphia as the Protestant Episcopal Church. They weren't going to tr get very far in the United States calling themselves the Church of England. Thomas Jefferson's Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom set out the principle of separation of church and state and ended any legal oversight or enforcement of religious belief. Uh, one thing the text overlooks, I think, is that the first state constitution to enshrine freedom of religion was the Rhode Island state constitution with Roger Williams, of course. The first amendment to the constitution adopted in 1791 ended with the formal ended the formal step ended the formal establishment of religion congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof this brings us to the french revolution uh, to em eliminate any influence from Rome, Catholic clergy were now required to sign the Civil Constitution pledging obedience to the Republic. While this was a form of secularization, it can also be seen as a reassertion of the independence of the French Catholic Church from Rome, asserted after Francis I, after his defeat of papal forces in Italy. Clergy now became employees of the state, elected by their parish or bishopric. All priests and bishops had to swear an oath of obedience to the new order or face dismissal, de deportation, or death. This caused considerable difficulty for Pope Pius VI. Yet as the revolution developed, more explicitly anti-religious views began to dominate. Voltaire and his circle argued that every positive religion, including Judaism, the various Islamic sects and Christian denominations had corrupted a pure, rational concept of God, known to every person through nature and reason. The reformation of religion might well focus on the French Catholic Church, but it extended far beyond this. A new state religion was thus required, grounded in the worship of the Supreme Being. A still more radical view came about with a series of developments that shifted France from the constitutional monarchy in which the Catholic Church had a continuing role to an implicitly atheist republic in which the only gods acknowledged were the ideals of the revolution and those who supported them. Violence against priests and religious orders became common. And I should have a picture here of the goddess of reason who was enshrined in a, in a cathedral, and uh, that's a clear, uh, what is the word I'm looking for, a, uh, a clear marker of the departure of the French Revolution from the ideals of Catholicism. Let's talk for a moment about the slave trade, which was an integral part of the British economy in the 18th century. Traders plied a triangular route between English ports in West Africa where slaves were purchased from local tribal leaders in exchange for manufactured goods. The ships then headed across the Atlantic Ocean on the Middle Passage to American and Caribbean ports in a journey lasting up to eight weeks. The slaves were then sold and the ships were taken the ships took on cargo such as cotton, tobacco, and sugar, and then returned to England. John Newton was the captain of a slave ship who experienced a religious conversion in 1748, which led him to realize the inhumanity of his actions as a slave trader. He left his life as a slave ship captain and went on to become an ordained minister of the Church of England. He uh, published his authentic narrative in 1764, uh, relating his experiences commanding a slave vessel, which aroused public concern about the morality of the slave trade. A giant of this uh, of abolitionism was William Wilberforce, who was a member of Parliament and had a religious conversion experience in 1784. He was part of a group known as the Clapham sect, who were agitating to bring about the abolition of, of slavery. 
And here's a picture of Wilberforce. There's a great film about his life and the efforts to end slavery called Amazing Grace. He was a close friend and colleague of William Pitt, the Prime Minister. Wilberforce entered the parliamentary debate in 1789 with a speech of three and a half hours describing the impact of the trade on Africa and the appalling conditions of the Middle Passage. He was supported by other, other religious leaders, including the former slave trader John Newton and the great Methodist preacher John Wesley. Wesley's last letter, which is uh, 1791, urged Wilberforce to maintain his parliamentary campaign against the trade. In the end, fierce opposition from commercial interests within Parliament defeated Wilberforce's attempts to end the slave trade. Yet he persisted, gaining allies. In 1807, Parliament passed a legislation to end the slave trade, not slavery, but at least the slave trade. In 1823, appeal for the slaves of the West Indies, Wilberforce appealed to the express authority of Scripture to challenge the social basis of slavery. Christianity insisted that the lower classes, instead of being an inferior order in creation, are even preferable objects of the love of the Almighty. Shortly after Wilberforce's death in 1833, Parliament finally abolished the slavery uh, throughout the British Empire. And that's where we're going to end today. Thank you for your kind attention. As always, let me know if you have any questions or want any more resources about this uh, video series. I'll be more than happy to correspond with you. And uh, tomorrow we'll continue. I'm sorry, next week we'll continue with the long 19th century. Uh, and the uh, various intellectual movements which arose to ch present a challenge to the credibility of Christianity. Thank you again. God bless. Talk to you soon.